Have you seen the movie Rain Man, where the main character is on the spectrum? Well, I'm not as extreme as that, but I do have Asperger's syndrome. Mostly, I'm just like everyone else, just with some quirks. Okay, maybe more than just some quirks. People with Asperger's struggle with social cues. While most people know it's time to stop talking when someone yawns, that's not so obvious to us. We're logical and detail-oriented, and you might know someone like us, possibly a tech geek or a brainy type like Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory. I'm particular about things and not very expressive. I find it hard to make eye contact, so I often look at mouths or noses instead. I excel in school because I'm a stickler for rules. Given clear tasks and goals, I make a great employee. But when it comes to being in charge, well, that's not my strong suit. Why do you need a whole week off for your mom's funeral? Isn't the funeral just one day? So your boss might not have been totally unreasonable, just someone with Asperger's. When my parents passed away when I was young, my grandparents took me in. They had raised six kids, but none quite like me. I was always stirring up trouble at school, mainly because of the questions I asked like, if this week is anti-bullying week, what was last week? Or, why do we have to line up quietly in height order during a fire drill? Do taller people burn slower? Even though I did great in school and got a scholarship for college, my grandpa would sometimes shake his head and say, there's something off about that boy. I never went on dates in high school because I couldn't understand all the games girls played with boys' heads. Instead, I just read everything I could find. Grandpa, being a practical man as well as an old navy hand, bought me a 403 for my 18th birthday. I enjoyed the gift like any teenage boy, and made a standing arrangement with the young lady whenever I had funds to afford her charms. My first big romance started with an unexpected situation. I was filling up my gas tank at a mall before starting my meals on wheels route for seniors. It wasn't because I'm super nice, it was part of a scholarship requirement. I chose meals on wheels because I could do it alone. But as I got into it, I found the seniors really interesting. These folks had been through a lot, surviving the Great Depression and shaping our nation's history. They were like living history books, and I could ask them questions, making it even better. They enjoyed sharing their stories with anyone willing to listen. So there I was, paying for my gas, when a girl ran by, being chased by two guys, a big one and a smaller one. Suddenly, the girl jumped into my car and locked the doors. The two guys kept yelling and hitting my car. The store clerk was already on the phone with emergency. I walked over and yelled, Hey, back off my car. The shorter guy, Mutt, demanded I open the car. I won't do that. I replied firmly, We'll wait for the police. I need a report for my insurance, and I'll need your info since you both caused damage to the car. It belonged to my grandma and was in perfect shape. I washed it every Saturday with premium wax called Mother's. Shut up, the bigger guy, Jeff, cut in. Then he pointed at himself. The cops are already here, so unlock that junk now. I glanced at Mutt and Jeff. They weren't wearing uniforms or showing badges. Can I see some ID or a badge, please? Mutt stepped closer. We don't have time for this, he muttered to Jeff. Then he grabbed my arm, trying to twist it. I should mention, I took up martial arts to improve my coordination and confidence, which really helps me handle situations like this. They drilled into me the rule. No response unless someone physically touched me. I actually liked this rule because I didn't like being touched. It fit my black and white view of the world with Asperger's. So I ignored words, but could react to physical acts. I spent three times a week and Saturdays at the local Aikido place so much that it felt like a second home. Back to the present, Mutt was shocked when I countered his arm lock with a move I'd practiced a million times in Aikido class for over a decade. As I got up, I said, You touched me first, please don't do that again. Then the girl in the car yelled a warning as Jeff charged at me. I thought, This is like my last belt test. I used a move to flip him into a gas pump. The girl laughed at them. 
You too can't even handle one pudgy kid. You better bring more buddies before you get hurt. I wasn't laughing. These guys showed no sign of stopping. Jeff quickly got up with a taser. When he tried to use it, I redirected his hand into a bucket of windshield wiper fluid, causing the electricity to shock him badly. I then dodged Mutt's baton and used a squeegee to counter him, tripping him with its handle. The girl stopped laughing when Mutt pulled out a magnum and told me to freeze. During our training, we often practiced tool defense with the motto, run from a knife, run at a magnum. The idea was to close the distance because a magnum from afar is more dangerous than a knife. I rolled closer to Mutt because people often aim high. That moment, Mutt did it twice, shattering my car window. The girl screamed. I caught Mutt off guard, quickly disarming him by controlling his wrist and elbow. Right then, police car showed up, sirens blaring. The cops ordered me to drop the tool. I did but then someone knocked me down and Mutt jumped on me. I blacked out. I ended up in a cell for over a day. No phone call. No rights read. It turned out Mutt and Jeff were the cops who later offended me while I was restrained. Other inmates left me alone. Seemingly impressed, I'd stood up to two cops. On the second day, the jail staff, who had been ignoring me, suddenly got nervous. Some went out of their way to say they treated me like any other suspect and had nothing to do with what happened before I got there. Anthony, the jailer called, opening my cell door. Come with me. As I walked out, I was surprised to see the girl from my car and an older man waiting. The jailer seemed uneasy as he led me to them. Here you go, judge. Bum, your honor. He's in good shape, just like I said. We kept him safe. The judge didn't respond to the jailer, but examined my face, focusing on a bruise from when Jeff hit me with a phone book. The girl started taking pictures with her phone. He looks real safe to me. How many of you brave guys did it take? She glanced at the bruises on my wrists. Beating up a cuffed man, huh? The judge waved them off. That's enough. Then he turned to me. Let's go, son. We're going to shake things up. With that... The judge walked away, and both the girl and I followed. We sat outside the Metro Police Commissioner's office, watching busy men in suits going in and out with papers. The judge hadn't come out since going in. Would you like something to drink? Asked the commissioner's administrative assistant. Yeah, I'll take some soda, any kind's fine. I said. Soda, tea, or coffee, sorry, she clarified. Oh, so you didn't mean anything. Just soda, tea, or coffee. That's confusing, I remarked. We only have soda, tea, or coffee, sorry, she clarified. Oh, so you didn't mean anything, just soda, tea, or coffee. That's confusing, I remarked. The girl chimed in. We'll both have soda. Any kind's fine, thanks. She pulled me to a chair. Relax, dude. Are you always so uptight? I don't know what uptight means, but I was just trying to help her be clearer, I explained. Miscommunication can cause problems. Okay, you're a bit quirky, she interrupted, but in a cute way. Now, quiet down. Don't you want to know what happened after the cops showed up at the gas station? I assume you'll tell me. Isn't that why you're here? I replied. She rolled her eyes. Fine. First off, my name's Dawn. I pointed at her badge, but it says New Dawn. Yeah, my parents were into crystals and stuff, so technically it's New Dawn. But call me Dawn, okay? Can I call you Tony? You can, but I won't answer to Tony because my name's Anthony. I clarified. Dawn chuckled. All right, Anthony it is. I was running because those two guys tried to nab me for shoplifting. Were you actually stealing? Dawn shot me a look. Seriously, like a big store cares about some small stuff. Do you know how little they pay in taxes and the pitiful wages their workers get? Not to mention the child labor overseas. What does that have to do with you taking stuff from the store? It's a franchise, so technically you were stealing from the owner, not the big corporation. Whatever, Don waved it off. 
Don't you think the whole police department is corrupt? Look at those two jerks who attacked you. They were an exception, I said. Dawn looked puzzled. And what? I gestured to stop her. The average income of a cop is pretty normal. Nowhere near rich. They just enforce laws. If you don't like the law, change it or elect someone who will. Don't blame those who enforce it. That's all I gotta say. Now tell me what happened next. Dawn shook her head. You're something else. Once the other cops showed up, I slipped out of your car and hid in the gas station. I saw those two cops grab the security footage and threaten the clerk. She held up her phone. But I recorded everything from the start. They didn't know. They didn't even identify themselves as cops, just went after you. I got it all, even their threats to the clerk. Then I saw the Meals on Wheels stuff in your car, so I called them and said, send lawyers, tools, and money. She glanced at the commissioner's door. Did you know the judge runs Meals on Wheels? I nodded. Yeah, and he's the big shot judge for the county and the top dog in state politics. He even spoke at my graduation. Don's eyes widened. That makes sense. After I called Meals on Wheels, a bunch of state troopers showed up at the gas station. They took your car, grabbed the clerk and me, and rushed us to the judge's office. He was furious when he saw the footage on my phone. It was like a royal court in there. People showed up fast, even though it was late. Folks in fancy clothes, all sorts, helping to find you. She touched the bruise on my face. Those two jerks were going to bury you in paperwork, wait till your bruises faded, then say it was your word against theirs. They even planted pills in your car. Just then, the admin lady got a call. Hanging up, she spoke to me. Anthony, his honor wants to see you in his office. To sum it up, the two cops got fired and faced charges. The police commissioner was relieved to get rid of them, especially since they had a history of complaints. They were caught working mall security while on duty with Metro PD, which sealed their fate. Other officers involved got reprimands. The commissioner, DA, and judge owed me a favor. They were surprised when I asked them not to penalize anyone else. Those officers had just trusted Mutt and Jeff's story, believing I was part of a gang. I received a substantial payout from Metro. I'm not one for luxury, but I took the money because I knew a jury wouldn't like how I was treated. A week later, Don came by. Let's go, Anthony, Don said, eyeing my place. Heard you got your check. Time to celebrate. I glanced around my simple place. It's not fancy, but it's home. Whatever, Don replied. We're hitting the town tonight. I can't eat any of this, Don declared, slamming the menu down. We were at one of the town's finest steakhouses, a spot my grandparents reserved for special occasions when we could afford it. They served the best beef, and when in season, crabs or lobster. Peering over the menu, I asked Don, What's the issue with the meat choices? She shot me a disgusted look. I'm a vegetarian, she said, pointing at the menu. Is there anything here that didn't have a brutal ending? You're a vegetarian, I said, surprised. Yeah, she confirmed. I remembered something my grandfather once said. You know, Don, the original meaning of vegetarian is poor hunter. Don jabbed her finger at me. You're clueless. Nature didn't make us for hamburgers. I countered with another of grandfather's quotes. If nature didn't want us eating hamburgers, why'd they make cows so easy to catch? Ever heard of cheetah burgers? Dawn seemed irritated. Humans weren't meant for meat. Our ancestors lived on wild grains, fruits, and veggies. I gave her a puzzled look, but we're not living in caves anymore. Back then, people barely made it to twenty, while cavemen lasted a whole twenty-five years. She waved me off. No one realizes ancient hunters only succeeded about ten percent of the time. Hunting was risky, easy to break bones, twist ankles, and no medical help. Without plants, they'd starve. Dawn, you're scared of spiders. Can't imagine you munching on termites. She grimaced. You, 
Anthony. Gross. I clasped my hands. Cave folks got their protein from insects. Termites were a hit, being 38% protein. Some Venezuelan ones are even 64% protein. They're also loaded with iron, calcium, and amino acids like tryptophan. Don brushed it off, flipping the menu. We need to go back to basics like our ancestors. Setting my menu down, I continued. So we shouldn't use penicillin or antibiotics, perform surgery without anesthesia, go back to when childbirth was the leading cause of death for women. No, Don replied. We need to be more self-sufficient, she gestured around the crowded room. It really bothers me seeing what everyone else is eating. I tried to understand her perspective, but it seemed a bit unreasonable. Don, being bothered by what others eat, is like getting upset at someone having a donut when you're on a diet. Dawn chuckled and dropped her menu on the table. I'll have a salad, but dessert's on me at your place. Are you sure? I asked, showing her the dessert options on the menu. Tonight's special is homemade key lime pie with whipped cream. I can't think of a better choice for dessert. Well, I was mistaken. Dawn's dessert idea was far better than the key lime pie. Plus, I wasn't used to having key lime pie three times in one evening. You haven't been in many relationships, have you? Don asked, snuggling up to me as we lay naked on my bed. I held up a finger. Don gave me a look and sighed. That's all right. I've only had three serious relationships myself. But I've had closeness more than once, I protested, thinking of my escort friend. Oh, you mean closeness? Don exclaimed. That's different. I've had it with more than three guys. How many? I inquired. I don't remember, she replied, gazing at the ceiling. It's not like I hook up with a guy every month. That's okay if you don't remember. I can do the math, I offered. You started at 17, right? That's the average age, isn't it? Dawn hesitated. Sure, let's go with 17. I started crunching the numbers. If you had a partner every other month for five years, that's 30 men. That's a lot. Taking a moment, I added, I don't think I even know thirty guys. Dawn tossed a pillow at me. That can't be right. Well, on average, women have 23.9 partners before marriage, even though most claim to have less than ten. The average age of brides today is twenty-nine. You can check it yourself. So your behavior would be considered 1.25 times more promiscuous than average. At your age and current pace, You'd have closeness with over 70 guys before marriage. That's way above average. I glanced at her. Would you call yourself a 403? Don gave me a sharp look. Are you calling me a 403? We just had closeness, and now you're calling me a 403. I was puzzled. I'm sorry, I'm not calling you this, just asking a question. You seem upset, and I didn't mean to upset you. I tried explaining my condition at dinner. I struggle with understanding emotional cues that most people pick up naturally. My obliviousness often leads to misunderstandings, and I never know exactly where I went wrong. Dawn relaxed, tracing her finger on my chest. That's okay, Anthony. I'm not a 403. She began moving her head down my body. But I can be your 403. It seemed logical that if Dawn was my girlfriend, she should live with me. So we needed a bigger place than my small apartment. Thankfully, the payout from Metro allowed me to afford a larger home. Money wasn't a big deal for me, but Dawn enjoyed the comforts it provided. I was studying math and accounting. I loved math, but Grandpa said I should have a practical skill, and people always needed bookkeepers. I wasn't sure what Dawn was studying in school. She was always involved in some rally or protest on campus, whether it was gays for the metric system, indigenous Muppet rights, or stopping condom testing on animals. I couldn't keep track of them all. But Dawn thrived on every demonstration in March. But if it made her happy, it made me happy. And speaking of happiness, I was determined to please Dawn in bed. So I did what I always did and researched everything related to women's pleasure. I scored internet forums, magazine articles, 
videos, and best-selling books. I even paid for a session to get advice from my escort friend. And no, I didn't do anything with her. I had a girlfriend now. Wow, exclaimed Dawn, her face flushed as she fell back onto the bed. Where did you find that? I returned the toy to the bedside drawer before replying. The clerk at the Pleasure Palace recommended it. She even gave me a demo in the back room, showing how to use it properly. My research showed it's one of the top-rated models. Dawn stared at me for a moment before bursting into laughter. You're the only guy who can watch a stranger do things and call it research with a straight face. And I believe you. Dawn got pregnant, which surprised me, not because she was expecting, but because it didn't fit our relationship timeline. Dawn didn't seem bothered that we were deviating from the usual path of dating, living together, marriage, then kids. It took me two weeks to convince Dawn of my reasoning and get her to the courthouse. That year was special because two wonderful things happened. Dawn married me, and most importantly, our daughter was born. The birth of our daughter sparked our first real argument. Dawn wanted a home birth with a midwife. I don't want our daughter born in a hospital full of sick people, she said. I want her to come into the world in a place of love, near her future bedroom and the kitchen where she'll grow. You barely cook in the kitchen yet you want to give birth there. I countered. With a baby girl in my life, everything felt wonderful. I dove into researching proper parenting techniques, seeking advice from child psychologists and experts at the university. Dawn grew frustrated with my constant corrections to her mothering. Eventually, she left most of the child rearing to me. It's not that she wasn't a good mom. She just got tired of me always taking our daughter out to the zoo, concerts, aquarium, and such. I felt it was my duty to expose my baby to new experiences while Dawn remained busy with her campus activities. The next ten years flew by. After earning my doctorate, I found myself working on Wall Street. A top player from a major hedge fund was scouting talent from various fields like math, physics, and engineering. He sought brainiacs who could make 2 plus 2 equal 5, metaphorically speaking. It was like solving a giant three-dimensional puzzle. On Wall Street, with the way rules were set up, we could make 2 plus 2 equals 9. While we raked in hefty paychecks for this Rubik's Cube math, I wasn't driven by money. As they say, the poor want to be rich. The rich want to be kings, and kings are never satisfied. But for me, the Wall Street game felt rigged. Still, if the money kept my family happy... I was content. I never imagined Dawn would cheat on me. We both had late nights, but Dawn threw herself into activism, now focusing on saving the environment. She was passionate about rescuing endangered animals for a while. You know, Anthony, humans are the reason why whales are nearly extinct. They're the blue whale's most dangerous predator, Dawn said. Dawn, while that's partly true, they're the largest mammals on Earth. What other predators do blue whales have? Pelicans with machine tools. Lions on jet skis. I replied. Her views on climate change baffled me too. Dawn, does it seem ironic to you to drive an Escalade to a Save the Planet rally? I asked. Anthony, it's a hybrid. It's very fuel efficient. When I stop for more than a few seconds, the engine shuts off to save fuel, she defended. Well, my grandpa had a car like that years ago, I responded, pulling up a web page on my laptop. But consider the resources used to make your Escalade and dispose of the hybrid battery. It leaves a carbon footprint, as big as Bigfoot. Dawn threw her hands up before responding. You want your wife and child to drive around in a Volkswagen Jetta? Well, they're one of the safest cars, and the diesel model has much better mileage than your SUV Hybrid Plus. I countered. We hardly ever argued. I didn't see the point, but I couldn't understand why Dawn needed so much stuff. She'd buy these ugly dresses with designer labels and always say, this looks so much better on. I'd think on what? On fire, but kept quiet. When Dawn gave birth to our son, I was ecstatic. I don't know who is happier with the new addition, his big sister or me. 
But a few years later, the housing market crashed, and that's when things went downhill, at least for Dawn. Like most Americans, I didn't get a government bailout. Those were reserved for CEOs and big financial institutions that were deemed too big to fail. I ended up at a small-town bank in the South, far from Wall Street. My salary was a fraction of what I used to make, and our house was underwater as soon as we bought it. Gone were the European vacations, private clubs, private schools, spas, tutors, Cadillac Escalades, and Starbucks was a thing of the past. I was proud of how my children adjusted. My daughter loved her public school, and my son was thrilled to have a big yard to play in. My job at the small bank wasn't as demanding as Wall Street, but the people were friendly. But even I could see that Dawn wasn't happy. I didn't realize just how unhappy she was until I walked into our bedroom eight months after we moved and saw her packing clothes into a suitcase. Dawn, it looks like you're packing for a trip. I don't get my one-week vacation until I've been at the bank for a year, I said. They need me in Manhattan, Anthony. I'm going to help out with the Occupy Wall Street protest, Dawn replied. Dawn, we can't leave now. It's the middle of the school year. I just finished my probation period at work, and our bank accounts are pretty low, I argued. I don't care. Occupy Wall Street is a huge deal. They need me. I'll only be gone a few weeks, Dawn insisted. Dawn, we need you here. What about our kids? I pleaded. Don't be such a baby, Anthony. Our daughter can take care of herself after school until you get home. I arranged for Janet, the teller at the bank with the kid our boy's age, to have her babysitter watch both her boy and ours until you pick him up, Dawn retorted. Military families have to deal with long separations when soldiers are deployed, Dawn added. Dawn, you're not a soldier. There's no war going on, and Occupy Wall Street isn't a battle. No one called you up, I reasoned. Anthony, they need me. It's my calling to help lead them, Dawn insisted. Dawn, you can't lead from a crowd. Dr. Goncolo, a well-known psychologist, showed that being part of a like-minded group activates the pleasure centers of the brain. If you're letting others do your thinking, it's time to move on, I urge. Dawn closed her suitcase forcefully. Don't argue with me, Anthony. You're not going to win this one, Dawn asserted firmly. I sat down, trying to reason with her. In a marriage, either spouse can win if they push far enough. It's called divorce, I reasoned. She turned from her suitcase. We're not becoming one of those 50% marriages that end in divorce. Well, Dawn, the other 50% end in death, as in till death do us part. I retorted. I tried to explain the practical issues with her trip. The tires on your car won't make it to New York. I was going to replace them next payday. I explained. I'm not taking the car. I'm getting a ride from a guy I met online who blogs about the movement. Dawn replied. And how will you pay for it? We can barely cover expenses this month, I queried. He said we could figure something out. Dawn shrugged. For the first time, I didn't have any answers. I sat there, stunned, and didn't even hear the car that drove Dawn away. I do know she didn't even kiss her children goodbye, I lamented. I couldn't understand why Dawn left. I told the kids mommy was at a rally up north, but I didn't know when she'd be back, I continued. The media had a blast when they found out a protester at Occupy Wall Street was married to a banker. They called Don Occumum. Even in our small town, this caused problems, I recalled. Dad, what's a hoe? My son asked. A hoe is like a rake used in gardening, I explained. Why are kids at school saying mom is a garden rake? Then my daughter walked in. It's hoe. Not ho. You know, like 403. I recounted. Your mom's not a 403, and that's a bad word. Go play outside until dinner. I told him. I directed. After he left, my daughter sat heavily in a chair. Dad, you have to stop mom. She's ruining my reputation at school. People are saying terrible things. I recalled. We can't control what people say and honestly, they probably don't think about us much, 
I comforted her. Dad, she exclaimed dramatically, don't you care mom's living with some stranger in a tent, and it's all over the internet. I tried to stay calm. If it upsets you, stay off the internet, daddy. My friends keep sending me links to the blog. It's disgusting. You have to do something. I promised her I will. Honey, I will. I assured her. After leaving countless voicemails, I finally reached Dawn. Sorry, Anthony, it's been chaotic here, she said. But Dawn, you haven't called back. I've been the one reaching out, I pointed out. You can't imagine what's happening here. No one's listening to my problems, she replied. If no one's listening, then don't share your problems, I suggested. 20% don't care, and the other 80% are glad it's not happening to them. Fine, Anthony, you wouldn't get it. There are thousands of people here from regular folks to celebrities, she said. That's great, Dawn. Any other moms who left their families? I asked. Don't be sarcastic, Anthony. You're making it sound like I care more about toiletries than my family, she retorted. Dawn, toilet paper is a basic necessity. I'm not being sarcastic. How can I and the kids be your priority when you're with another guy? I questioned. I recounted. Don't be naive, Anthony. We're just sharing a tent. We're not sleeping together, she insisted. Dawn, let me read you something from your tent mate's blog. Yesterday's entry was called Occupying the Ocumilf Muff, I began. Dawn cut me off before I could continue. Anthony, you can't believe everything on the internet. He's just making things up for attention. When a jobless immigrant living in a tent with my wife describes the birthmark on your thigh, I believe the rest of what he says. You need to come home. I've arranged for us to see a highly recommended marriage therapist, I urge. I'm not going to let some backwoods, Bible-thumping redneck tell me I have to submit to you and stay home, she countered. Dawn, that's not what I'm saying. You need to come home, now, I insisted. I can't. This is important to me. When my mom said learning to swim was important, they tossed me in the lake. That's how I learned, she replied. I recalled. I responded. Ever think they might not have wanted to teach you to swim? Glancing at my watch, I said, there's a bus leaving at midnight with your name on it. If you're not on it, I'm filing for divorce. I overheard Dawn speaking to someone as she covered the phone. Anthony. I can't leave now. I'm deeply involved in this movement. Dawn, don't mistake movement for action. Running around in circles gets you nowhere, no matter how big the circle, I replied. Are you just going to abandon me? Dawn exclaimed. Feeling puzzled, I replied. Dawn, you left me and the kids. Be on that bus. Then I hung up. As expected, Dawn didn't take the bus. I didn't hear from her until a week later. Anthony, how could you? Don yelled over the phone. You're filing for divorce. Claiming abandonment. You cut off my cell. I had to borrow a phone to call you. That's why I didn't recognize the number. And those awful pictures you included with the divorce papers, Don continued. Was that necessary? What if the kid saw them? I wasn't surprised by her reaction and told her so. Now you're worried about the kids. Just so you know, the kids found the pictures. Your tentmate, who you claim not to be involved with, posted them on his blog, and your daughter heard about them from classmates. I simply printed them out, I replied. Anthony, I'm sorry. I swear I didn't know he was taking pictures. I got carried away in the moment. We're all fighting for the same cause, and I made a mistake. How long did this moment last, Dawn? I sent you seven pictures, each with a timestamp from seven consecutive nights. Okay, Anthony, it wasn't the smartest move to sleep with him, but in my defense, it was just one guy, Dawn explained. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How does the number of partners matter? With the background noise, I strained to hear Dawn's response. Anthony, you need to see this in perspective. Is my mistake worth losing everything over? Our marriage doesn't have to be over because of this. Plenty of couples have gone through worse and come out stronger. 
This event could actually strengthen our marriage. Dawn, that's as confusing as when Yogi Berra said, if you don't go to other people's funerals, they won't come to yours. As I adjusted the phone, Dawn continued, Listen, I have a guy here who's connected. His dad owns a major law firm in this state. He's saying you'll get destroyed in court if you keep pushing for this divorce. Amidst the noise, a man's voice took over the phone. Hello? Can you hear me, Anthony? Yes, I can. I responded. Buddy, you're handling this all wrong, the voice said. I come from a big law firm, and I've seen guys like you get crushed by the courts every day. If I represent your wife, you're going down. Do you even know who you're dealing with? This conversation felt odd. Sorry, I don't know who your father is. Maybe your mom didn't tell you. What? The voice on the other end spluttered. Staying calm, I replied. Maybe your mom had relations with so many men that it's hard to pinpoint who your father is. I'm here to help if you need assistance. Do you have any features that suggest African American, Hispanic, or Asian heritage? You jerk, the man yelled. My family has been in this country since it was a colony. Why are you getting so upset? I ask honestly. I'm just trying to help. Plus, I wasn't the one whose mom had multiple partners before you were born. Maybe you should check if she lived near a military base when you were conceived. The government keeps a DNA database, so you could confirm who your mom used as a sperm donor. I'm going to destroy you in court. I heard the guy shout before Don must have taken the phone from him. Anthony, are you still there? Don asked. Yeah, I'm here, Don. Are you sure you want that guy to represent you in our divorce? He seems pretty unstable, probably because he's unsure about his dad. Forget him. Forget this divorce, Don said. Everyone cheats at least once in a marriage. It's not a big deal anymore. You're wrong, Don. A recent Gallup poll found that 91% of Americans consider having an affair to be morally wrong. Only 9% think it's okay. Divorce might be more accepted now, but adultery is still seen as immoral in most states. Damn it, Anthony. Divorce isn't the answer. Don, there are no right answers to wrong questions. Fine. You want to fight? Don spat. I'll beat you in this. Remember, those who live by the sword die by the sword. What's cutlery got to do with our divorce, Don? Besides, nowadays those who live by the sword get shot by those who don't. I heard more swearing before the line went dead. One thing was clear. Dawn came out on top in the divorce, with her lawyer making sure I left with almost nothing. Our state's alimony laws worked in her favor, and her attorney used that to take my retirement savings, house equity, and cash. But I didn't mind losing those material things, because I got sole custody of our kids in exchange. Dawn may have won the battle, but it felt like an empty victory to me. Dawn's involvement in the Wall Street protest got her some attention, even leading to a book deal and movie contract. My daughter showed me the press release, and it explained why Dawn didn't push for alimony, but it didn't make sense why she drained my accounts and claimed she couldn't afford child support. Her newfound fame brought minor scorn from our small town, which caught me off guard. Even my co-workers treated me differently. Janet, a single mom and a co-worker, shed some light on the situation. You might not see it, Anthony, but there's still a lot of old-fashioned thinking here, especially about handling women, Janet said. But what could I have done differently? I asked. This mess wasn't my doing. Janet patted my shoulder sympathetically. I get it, Anthony. Your ex-wife, Dawn, seems a bit off. With all the therapy and medication out there, I bet a quarter of women in this country are dealing with some kind of mental health issue, Janet remarked. So that means three quarters are walking around untreated. Janet suddenly punched my shoulder, grumbling about us all being the same. Their opinions don't matter to me. Besides, what does my personal life have to do with my job anyway? I replied. At the bank, trust is key. If you can't manage your own family, folks wonder how you'll manage their money, Janet explained. She might have been right, but my family came first. 
The bank job was just a way to support them. However, it did lead to some issues at work. Some customers avoided me, fearing my personal problems might rub off on them. Then one day the manager surprised me. You're in charge tomorrow, he said. Keep the staff in line. The next morning, I arrived early and greeted my team. After a brief tour and a stop at the restroom, I stepped out to a shocking scene. Masked men were terrorizing my staff, and one held explosives overhead. Are you the freaking manager? One of them shouted. I'm the manager for now, I said, recalling robbery training. If you're here for cash, we'll give it. Otherwise, come back when we're open. The offender grabbed my tie, shaking the dangerous device. Stop the jokes, jerk, he shoved me down. Struggling with my tie, I got up slowly. I hated those things. They started in Croatia ages ago as a sign of loyalty to the king. Why we still wear them is a mystery. I kept my hands up as trained addressing the offender. We don't want trouble. I'll get you the money. No need for violence. You better. He tossed a bag to the tellers. A million in cash now. Remembering my training, I didn't argue. I'd love to, but we're a small branch. We only get $75,000 weekly. Plus that bag won't hold a million. What the heck are you saying? 22026 pounds, I explained. Each $1,100 bill weighs a gram. With 10,000 bills in a million, that's 22026 pounds, but we don't have that much. The offender pulled Janet from the teller line, holding her hostage with some dangerous device at her head. I hadn't dealt with such things except in video games, so I couldn't tell its type. Fragmentation, high explosive, or phosphorus, but it seemed unusual. Listen, manager, the offender demanded my attention. Give me all the money in this bank now, or I'll blow her head off. Okay, I said, motioning toward the vault. The funds are still in there. Then let's freaking go. He pushed Janet toward the bag, causing her to fall. In the vault, past the safe deposit boxes, we huddled behind the bar door. The robber left with the bag. The offender blocked our exit and then, unexpectedly, tossed the device into the vault. Goodbye, suckers, he shouted as he ran off. Time seemed to slow down as the device rolled toward Janet. I heard screams and saw one teller faint. Remembering I was in charge, I dropped to grab it, feeling like I was moving through Syrah, but managed to catch it. I knocked Janet down and dashed towards the vault exit, feeling like I was running through thick mud. It seemed to take ages, but I finally made it out, using my foot to shut the vault door. I knew the sturdy old door would shield everyone inside from the blast, but in front of me, the barred door to the safety deposit room was closed, trapping me inside with the device. Spotting an open safety deposit box we used for demos, I stuffed it inside and shut the lid tight. Grabbing the box with my left hand, I pushed it into an open slot in the wall filled with other boxes. Then everything exploded into blinding light, and I was thrown backward over the counter. As my vision cleared, my ears were ringing and my body felt like it was covered in bee stings. Janet was kneeling in front of me, her lips moving but no sound coming out. She pulled off my necktie and used it to wrap my left hand. I looked up and saw a hole where I'd put the device. Smoke lingered in the room and my face was sweaty. Wiping my brow with my hand, I saw it was covered in blood. More of the staff gathered around, but I still couldn't hear them. I tried to get up, but I felt too heavy. Janet signaled for me to stay down, then began to take off her blouse. Her perfume was a relief from the smell of tool powder, and I was trying to guess the scent when I blacked out. The fog lifted from my mind slowly, and I realized I was lying in a hospital bed. Bandages were wrapped around my left hand and foot. A doctor in a white coat stood nearby, jotting down notes on a chart. Welcome back, Rambo, the doctor said casually not bothering to look up. I removed a lot of shrapnel from your face and scalp, but you'll heal up fine. Plus, chicks dig scars. He pointed his pen at me. 
You also lost a couple of fingers and your thumb, he continued. But luckily there was enough of your thumb left to transplant your big toe onto your hand. With some rehab, you'll regain about 80 to 85 percent of movement in that hand, though I doubt you'll be tickling the ivories at Carnegie Hall anytime soon. I was puzzled. Doc, I've never played the piano, let alone at Carnegie Hall. The doctor just shrugged. Good thing someone used your tie to stop the bleeding. That quick thinking might have saved your life. With that, he hung up my chart and left the room. I felt someone move on the other side of the bed and saw the bank manager standing there. Anthony, you crazy son of a witch, he said, shaking his head. I never would have guessed you'd pull off a stunt like that. The security cameras caught everything. It looked like a scene straight out of a Bruce Willis Die Hard movie. He ran his hand through his hair. You know, Anthony, we're all pretty proud of you and what you did. And well, we all feel bad about how you've been treated lately with the divorce and all. There was an awkward silence before the bank manager tried to change the subject by clapping his hands together. Of course, you're not the only one we're proud of, he said, pointing behind him. Janet here slipped a couple of dye packs into the robber's bag. Those fools were looking inside when the packs blew up, covering them, and the entire windshield with dye. They lost control of the car and crashed into Cream Time Donut Shop, he chuckled. Those jerks got busted by every cop in the county. I tried to grin, but my face felt weird. The bank manager turned to Janet. Hey, Janet, I gotta head back to work. Can you keep an eye on Anthony for me? He squeezed my shoulder. Take all the time you need, Anthony. The bank's covering everything, and we're all damn proud of you. After the manager left, Janet spoke up. Your kids are with mine at the sitters. They're having a blast being the kids of the local hero. She closed the door before coming over to my bed. There was a half-smile on her face as she said, A die-hard scene, Anthony. More like die stupid. You do realize that was a flashbang, not a real explosive device. It was an M84 flash device, I interjected, realizing what had happened. Standard issue, two-thirds of a pound, packed with magnesium and ammonium. Janet shook her head. I don't know about all that, but if you hadn't gone all action hero, we'd just have a bunch of ringing ears. I glanced at the bandages on my hand. Yeah, by trapping that blast in the safety deposit box, I turned a harmless bang into a real explosion. I knew I hadn't meant to put everyone in danger, but I still felt foolish. Sorry, Janet, I never meant to risk the bank or its staff. Janet grinned at me. Forget about the bank. They're loving the attention. And you, you're my hero. I don't just strip down for anyone, you know. She wiped her lipstick off my mouth. They all need a slice of humble pie for how they treated you. I've got some friends at the sheriff's office. They're spinning it like you defused a real explosive device. They won't admit it was a flashbang, but they won't deny it either. I pointed at her with my good hand. But Janet, won't the truth come out in court? She chuckled. Those idiots took a plea deal. They're not going to admit it was a flashbang. It's better for their rep in prison if everyone thinks they were big shots. Using a glorified firecracker doesn't sound as tough. Enjoy the hero status. Heck, you might even be the town's parade marshal this year. I shrugged, feeling uneasy but too exhausted to care. Janet gave my thigh a squeeze. And you owe me a blouse. Plus, the bank owes you some cash, and I'm collecting. I never did get to buy Janet that blouse. She refused to take any money, even for taking care of my kids during my hospital stay. Keep your money, Anthony, Janet insisted as I tried to pay her back. The boys keep each other busy, and your daughter is like the daughter I always wanted. I knew better than to argue, but I made a mental note to set up a college fund for her kids. As we pulled up to Janet's house, I was surprised to see a fancy limo parked outside. My surprise grew when I spotted my ex-wife Dawn and another woman on the porch. Janet muttered under her breath. Somewhere a village is missing its idiot as she helped me out of the car. 
Dawn and a serious-looking woman stayed on the porch as Dawn helped me up the driveway. Oh my God! Dawn exclaimed as she reached out to me. I flew here as fast as I could and got a limo. I stood still as Dawn hugged me. When she let go and stepped back to look at me, I noticed something in her eyes. I've never been big on the whole health craze thing. Unlike many newly divorced guys, I didn't dive into intense workout routines. Plus, my desk job didn't help my waistline much. No worries, Anthony, Don said, poking my stomach. I've got a new diet plan that'll shape you up in no time. I wasn't in the mood for a lecture on veggies from Don. The diet industry thrives on a 98% failure rate. Most people gain back all the weight they lose, even after shedding pounds. And as for fighting shape, I'm already there. Too heavy to run from a fight. Dawn tried to laugh it off. You're hilarious. But a little exercise will do wonders for you. My hand throbbed, and I was exhausted. If walking or biking were the key to immortality, mail carriers would live forever. A whale swims all day, eats fish, drinks water, and stays fat. A rabbit runs and hops, but only lives 15 years. A tortoise does nothing but lives up to 450 years. So, why should I exercise again? Don glanced at Janet standing nearby. Looks like you've inherited your aversion to exercise from her, she remarked, possibly taking a jab at Janet's figure. Janet narrowed her eyes and snapped. You know, there's plenty of evidence showing that women who carry a few extra pounds tend to live longer than the skinny ones who obsess over weight and end up in fights. The stern woman next to Dawn stepped forward to shake my hand. Hello, Anthony. I'm Dawn's publicist. But Dawn cut her off. What a perfect ending to my story. I nurse you back to health, and we all reunite as a family. The publicist nodded eagerly. The Lifetime channel was ecstatic when we pitched the idea to them. We might even turn it into a series. Dawn reached out to me. This could mean a lot of money and fame for me. I mean for us. No, I said plainly and calmly. What? Dawn and her publicist said simultaneously. No, I repeated. What part of no didn't you understand? The publicist went into damage control mode. Anthony, I'm on your side here, so you need to listen to Dawn. I shook my head at her. No matter the argument, there's always someone on your side that you wish was on the other. The publicist acted as if I hadn't spoken. I know you've been through a lot lately, and you might not be thinking clearly. The recent head injury and the shock of your and Dawn's separation may have clouded your judgment. You really should consider this opportunity. It's not every day that something like this comes your way. Janet gripped my arm to guide me toward the door before addressing the publicist. In that case, you'd better call before dropping by. We wouldn't want to mistake you for opportunity knocking. Don stepped in front of me. Anthony, stop. What are you doing? We belong together. You need me. You know you won't find anyone else like me. I stared at her for a while. Don, that doesn't even make sense. I don't even like you. Why would I want to find someone remotely similar to you? Don tried a different approach. Things aren't the same anymore, Anthony. Her words made me cringe as she went on. This is going to be a best-selling book and a national TV show. Do you really want to be painted as the villain? I mean, if I walk off this porch, by the time I'm done telling the story, even the dog will hate you. That's not true, Don. The dog won't care. Don turned to Janet. You're one of those Bible-thumping believers, aren't you? Isn't there something in Corinthians or Genesis about forgiveness or something you can use to help me out here. Janet released my arm to face Dawn and her publicist. Well, I don't have any Bible verses for you, but I do have one that might help Anthony. She glanced at Dawn and gestured toward the street. Get out of my house. Then Janet turned to wink at me. That's from Exodus. Dawn and the publicist were taken aback. You can't talk to me like that, Dawn stuttered. Janet kept walking me toward the door, speaking without looking back. I'd shoot you both in the head, but that'd just be a scratch, Don blurted out. We'll see what the sheriff has to say about your threats. This time, 
Janet did turn around, holding her cell phone out. Uncle Bob, the town sheriff, is number six on speed dial. When Dawn and the publicist didn't take the phone, Janet continued, I have a loaded magnum, eight acres of land, and a shovel. Don't mess with me or the people I care about. I hobbled through the door as Janet closed it behind me. Dawn's book ended up in the bargain bin pretty quickly and her movie, well, it didn't even make it to straight to video level. Her fifteen minutes of fame were short-lived. To her credit, she did try to visit the kids when she had time. We could tell how her career was going by the type of transportation she used when she came by. Limos turned into town cars, then taxis, and eventually shared shuttles. Dawn still came bearing gifts and stories of projects and development on each visit. The last time she came to town, she was with a washed-up actor driving a beat-up old Mercedes. My son caught her latest production, some cheesy low-budget reality show way up in the cable TV channels. Janet joked that Dawn suffered from vapidus lucidus. What's that? I asked. It's a made-up condition where people seek attention without actually achieving anything. They end up on obscure cable channels in the middle of the night, then fade into obscurity, only showing up occasionally in ads for personal hygiene or reverse mortgages. Dawn deserves our sympathy and maybe seven seconds of our attention. The kids found it funny. So I don't think Janet was serious or that Vapidus Lucidus is a real thing. Meeting Janet's brother was a pleasant surprise. He's also on the autism spectrum, which explains a lot about her understanding. Eventually, Janet and I got together. It just made sense since we had so much in common. And combining our families and resources allowed us to live a typical middle-income life. The kids adore Janet, and so do I, heck. I even got invited to ride on the main float in the Founders' Day Parade. People often think you need money to be wealthy, but I've learned that being rich doesn't always mean having lots of cash. It's not about what you have, but who you have with you. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.